Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, is it visible? Is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible, sir. Uh, in this video also, are there? Sir? Oh, yeah, there is video also. That I think it should be all right. Okay. So, is there any sound in video, sir? Beg your pardon? Uh, is there any sound in, in your video, sir? No, 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 there is no sound. Okay, otherwise you have to share sound as well while during the sharing your screen. Oh, no, my God, sir. Uh, no sound, no sound. Okay, then no issue, sir. So, can you make it full screen, sir? I am doing this. Yes, sir, it's perfectly visible. Okay. Uh, good evening, students. I think we shall start the program. It's nine, seven o'clock now. We we'll start with the uh, today. Also, we will have some uh, sport session. I want volunteers to uh, discuss it. So we we'll start with one uh, coronary NGO. You read and then discuss the uh, management. Any volunteers? Those who are about to appear for the DNB examination, uh, who have already finished their theory part and waiting for the practical examination, can volunteer to discuss the cases. Others can also do it, but uh, if there are uh, people who are from who are uh, who have just finished their theory theory part and are waiting for the practical examinations, I think they should be given preference. Anybody, Rona, could you like to start the discussion? Rona, are you there? Let me share a request to unmute him, sir. Uh, sir, I think Rona, sir, is disconnected. All are disconnected? No, Rona, sir, is disconnected. Oh, he's disconnected. Oh, and anybody else who would like to discuss this uh, and you and tell the uh, management strategy? How will you decide the management strategy? Anybody who would like to discuss? Dr. Mugesh Kumar Sharma, would you like to discuss the case? Anybody who would like to? Uh, it's all simple cases, so there should not be any problem. So someone has joined from a name NSV506. Uh, do you want to speak something? Dr. Kumar, would you like to discuss the case? Dr. Kumar? Dr. Shudhi, would you like to 
take up the challenge uh good evening sir good evening sudhi uh, i would like to attempt so okay. this is angiogram of uh, uh, coronaries uh, okay. showing uh, this is uh, arevo caudal image yes uh, done from femoral oh no what do you okay you okay, can see the a uh, catheter uh, coming through the descending thoracic yes. artery yes yes sir and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, lmca and from lmca mm -hmm. looks like lmca is ectatic yes yeah, i don't know whether it is really ectatic or not but uh, uh, what you see is definitely a, a, a significant disease for the distal lmca and uh, 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 probably osteal lad involving osteal lad yes along with that uh, uh, proximal uh, lcx is also deceased sir yes proximal lcx is also is deceased you are right significantly involved sir yes so here is a distal uh, left main there is some irregularity of the mid part of the uh, left main also that also is uh, definitely deceased distal yes, yes. left main has got a very tight lesion and this lesion extends both to the lady as well as to the sir so what will be your management strategy the other lesions are not very significant there are lesions but uh, we need not go into the minor details of other lesions but then uh, uh, coming to the uh, the left distal left main uh, rc was uh, m only minor mild disease minor disease so how will you approach a left main distal left main lesion especially uh, distal left main which also involves the branches rca and the, the lad as well as the left circumflex yes sir uh, sir i would like to do this under uh, i was guidance okay and uh, attempt why wiring do do, why do you want to do under i was guidance uh, first thing is uh, lmc involvement yes and uh, uh, i would like to see the uh, i mean for wiring yes you uh, Hmm. Uh, it is uh, blindly wiring it is it is difficult to wire blindly sir yeah so i would like to do it under uh, iwas sir oh you want to do wire wiring under iwas i mean okay. first uh, iwas can okay, i was uh, help you in wiring uh, sir first i would like to uh... I agree with you that you can evaluate the left main by iwas that's a very good good method so that you can get about the <clears throat> the size of the, uh, the left main then the, uh, the the other sclerotic process how much the disease process all those things can be seen but i was cannot tell you um, yes, so yes. You, i don't think i was can cross this uh, stenotic lesion and if you try to do that it may you may injure the uh, the uh, you may create a uh, problem also so but you can definitely do an i was to evaluate the left main yes sir how do you when you there is a left main lesion what is the uh, the method by which you can evaluate whether you should send the patient for uh, cabg or you would like to uh, do a, a interventional procedure mm -hmm. so if the patient is diabetic uh, which one you think will be more preferred what is the evidence in a patient with uh, diabetes is the uh, is the interventional procedure more recommended or is it a cabg procedure so if the patient is diabetic then cabg we would like to go sir yeah no you need not make a, a, a flat statement but you can say that in diabetics all the studies have shown that the cabg is the preferred, preferred choice yes sir uh, preferred choice because of the problem that many patients with diabetes if you do an interventional procedure they yes. may come back with the uh, uh, recurrent uh, symptoms and uh, Uh, the cabg uh, patients do much better yes sir is there any any score which you can uh, uh, score, uh, so you can depend upon to decide the syntax scoring sir syntax scoring what is syntax scoring and what is the score in which you will do you will recommend the uh, uh, interventional procedure what is the score in which you will recommend uh, the uh, the cabg and what is the score in which you would like to evaluate or discuss with the patient before you take a decision uh sir so this scoring is done to know the complexity sir uh okay. very good the, the, score, the scoring is done to uh, look at the complexity of the lesion the lesion as well as 
uh, the, the extent of deletion, all those things are evaluated in the syntax code. Yes. Yes. We are not uh, going to find the details of syntax code because we have to do a lot of spotters. So, what is the score where you will think that the introduction procedure is the choice, and what is the score in which you think that the surgical treatment is the choice, and then in between? Uh, I am not sure about the exact number, sir. Okay, anybody who would like to give a comment? Anybody from the uh, student group would you like to give a comment? Uh, what will be the uh, syntax score uh, when you will recommend a uh, international procedure and what is the score in which you will definitely think that surgery would be the most preferred treatment? You must have been doing a lot of procedures, especially seniors. Might have done plenty of procedures and uh, when you take decisions, you might be depending upon all these uh, uh, scoring system to decide what should be the approach. <clears throat> okay, uh, if the score is up to 22, then uh, these patients are good candidates for interventional procedure. Interventional yes. procedure. If the score is 33 and above, then they are, uh, uh, they, are, they are not suitable candidates for interventional procedure. They actually are ideal candidates for CABG. That is why yes. the long-term results are shown. Between 22 and 33, it is a gray zone. <clears throat> it partly depends upon the, the expertise of the uh, interventionist and also the, like, uh, the liking of the patient. Many other factors come into play. But in, in 22 to 33, if the patient is diabetic, I think these patients should go for a CABG procedure. But if the patient is not diabetic, then the, depending upon the, uh, the lesion, if it can be approached by an interventional procedure, yes, there is a, a room for us to do an interventional procedure. So whenever there is a left male lesion, you must know when to approach an intervention as an interventional uh, uh, procedure or at what time you will send the patient to the surgeon. And the long-term studies have all shown that uh, especially patients above the above uh, 22 uh, syntax for 22 or near about 30 and all, these patients definitely do much better with the with the surgery than with the uh, interventional procedure, mostly because many patients who undergo interventional procedure may come back with symptoms, symptoms again, and they may have to do a re-procedure. So that is the one a big uh, uh, Achilles heel, where the patients with the left main uh, intervention may come back with the symptoms again. Especially if you have tackled the uh, circumflex, the circumflex ostium is notorious to develop restenosis. So there is always a risk that if you are tackling a circumflex ostium, there is a, uh, there is a possibility that the patient may come back to you with restenosis and you may have to do a re-procedure. So that's one important point. Okay. okay. Any other comments somebody would like to ask or any, any other point? Okay, we'll go to the next one. Okay, what is this? The symbol, you know, many of you might have seen plenty. Any one of you? So is it ectasia of the artery? Or is it which, what, which artery? Uh, of the right coronary artery, proximal part. Would you like to uh, review that uh, uh, diagnosis? <clears throat> the the uh, right coronary artery, is it a straight artery or has it got a lot of branches? What are the branches of the right coronary artery? Okay, this looks like a graph then. Okay, no. yes, sir. It does not have any branch. Whenever you see a vessel without any branch, you must always think that it is uh, most likely a graph. Graph. Okay, this looks like a graph. Okay, sir. Yeah, because uh, RC has got plenty of branches, and this uh, this uh, injection does not have any. Yes, sir. It does not have any branch. Right. right sir. Okay. So, uh, uh, what are the precautions that you have to, uh, to do, or what are the variations that you have to adopt when you are doing a uh, graft intervention? So, venous graft interventions are. Uh, 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 are said to have a lot of thrombus burden. So we, Very good. 
should use a distal protection device to prevent yeah. a stroke so there is a, there is a, there is a class 1 indication and the recommendation is that we must always use a distal protection device one to what do you, what do you, are there any situations where you think that probably distal protection device cannot be required it's definitely indicated but there are certain situations like if the graft looks like an artery it is not a very large graft it is a okay. uh, average size the graft just like in this patient and if you if you think that the graft as a whole looks smooth excepting the lesion then there is a possibility that you can uh, uh, do a with a distal protection device distal protection device also has got a few problems because it is a very bulky device and when you manipulate it beyond the lesion uh, then there is a possibility that it, it itself may dislodge some of the uh, uh, some of the other sclerotic material and that may create a distal embolization but in general the recommendation is that you should do a distal protection device yes what else what about the stent size uh, is it should be uh, oversized or undersized or is it uh, depending upon the size of the vessel you can adopt no so not not aware of that sir any any one of you anybody because you you must have been doing lot of procedures and you must have done uh, uh, graft intervention also so when you take a uh, graft intervention one of the precautions is that especially if it's a large graft uh, you have to uh, have a distal protection device some people recommend even proximal protection device but i think distal protection device would be most preferred and second is that when you are still looking at a stent it is better to undersize the stent because if you oversize or if sometimes even with the correct size of the uh, uh, the graft vessel size sometimes there is a risk that you may rupture the graft so it's better to undersize the graft two important points one the size, the graft should be undersized and sorry the stent should be undersized and second <clears throat> it is better to use a distraction distal protection device so that distal embolization of the other sporting material from the gra graft can be prevented okay right yes next we'll go to the next one what is this What do you find there? It's all simple, straightforward things. We should not have any difficulty in uh, discussing these type of problems. People who have been working in the cath lab might have <clears throat> come across these type of problems Excellent. multiple times. Deception, sir. Yes, Ronak, are you there, Ronak, or? Yes, Yes, sir, Saroj, would you like to comment? Yes, sir. Sir, sir perforation. Sir, it's, yeah, it's a perforation, yes. It's a pin per, per, perforation. And uh, you, how will you classify perforation? Grading of... Yes, sir. There are five gradings of perforation. Yeah, yeah, very good, yes. Uh, and it does not matter. Say, and it's important that whenever a perforation is shown, there will be a question on... Uh, how will you grade perforation and depending upon the grading you have to decide the treatment or this is a point uh, pinpoint perforation how will you manage this the level of the perforation for uh, n minutes no already the the stand uh, is still there so what what can you do so we can just dilate the balloon for a long time yeah, you you can like as a tamponade. You can you can uh, you are detect if you are detected immediately, you can just dilate the balloon and keep it there for about anyway from ten to fifteen minutes. Yeah. And some people also recommend that half the apparent dose can be reversed with. Protamin. <clears throat> uh. Protamin. So with protamin you can uh, reverse them. What is the dose of protamin? If suppose you want to re uh, reverse uh, five thousand units of heparin, what is the dose? Then for each hundred, one ml reverses hundred units. No, no, wrong. Fifty units, I think. Then it's still wrong. Sorry. 
and uh, one milligram neutralizes under units. This is not one ml. Okay, one milligram. One milligram. One milligram neutralizes under units of heparin. So you can decide. Okay, so uh, you must know about the uh, the, uh, the grade of perforation. Uh, there are five grades, and each uh, this is a simple perforation. And we just inflated the balloon for about fifteen minutes, and we also uh, uh, reversed the heparin. Half of the heparin dose was reversed, and patient did very well. There was no problem. But if there is a real rupture, and then there are problems, then how will you manage? Then covered stent. Yeah, you mm -hmm. have to put a covered stent. Very good, excellent. And sir. So you you may have to this, uh, has to and yeah if the patient uh, uh, develop hypotension auto transfusion may be done yes auto transfusion some people recommend some people may not if there is a large quantity of uh, fluid then uh, blood then you can do a auto transfusion see uh, the the one of the problems of uh, doing a perica pericardial tap from the uh, below the cp sternum is that you should be very careful that you don't you don't damage the liver sometimes when you go deep into the uh, to get into the pericardium sometimes there can be damage to liver and that can sometimes result in intra intra peritoneal bleeding into the abdomen and the patient can develop hypotension so in any patient following uh, the uh, pericardial synthesis the patient develops hypotension you must always think of the possibility of liver damage and bleeding into the uh, abdominal cavity so that also must be kept in mind, especially in a patient who develops unexplained hypotension following the pericardial synthesis. And what this usually happens when you remove the uh, the, uh, the the pigtail as well as the uh, the sheath, because till that time the sheath will obstruct the bleeding. And once you remove the, uh, the your hardware, then the patient can bleed into the peritoneum and can develop complications. So this is a simple preparation. Okay, right. We'll go to the next one. What is this? Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Is it Gauro? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just oh, now, John. Yeah. Sir, is it uh, intramyocardial hematoma, sir? No, my my uh, See, when there is no angio, there is no shadow. Actually, the whole thing is disappearing. So, uh, the eye staining is there, sir. That's what. Uh... No, no, there is no staining. You see, it is uh, it's clearing. You see, before the angio, there is nothing. And you can also see that. Uh, the, uh, the from the shadow, the the, uh, the the contrast is being ejected. Myocardial bridge, not bridge. Fistula, sir. Yeah, fistula. Yeah. Uh, uh, coronary cavernous fistula. Sir. Coronary cameral fistula. See, it is uh, actually it is extract into right ventricle, and you can see that the uh, fistula is there. It uh, it gets op opacified. Then gradually the the blood which is uh, getting into the R is being pumped out. So this is mm -hmm. a uh, coronary cameral fistula. This was on a routine angiogram we picked up picked it up. Uh, so sometimes you see this. So sometimes in when you do a routine angiogram you can see sometimes small uh, uh, coronary cameral fistulas. And this is a fistula into the right ventricle. Uh, which are the regions in which the fistula can drain to? So usually, mm -hmm. commonest location site is to. Are right ventricle and right side, and both to the right, 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 right. is the common side and also to the right atrium. And sometimes it can drain into the coronary sinus also. Okay, that's a coronary cameral fistula. Where are the catheters? And what I name the catheters and tell me where are these catheters? One is pigtail catheter. Yes, very good. Uh, 
other one multi purpose culture sir multi purpose no one is pictel catheter where is the pictel catheter yes sir pictel catheter sir from aorta to ah sir lv right ventricle yes it is from aorta to the left ventricle very good yes and other catheter sir other catheter is a venous sir from Uh, femoral vein oh. sir ivc then sir it has gone uh, to uh, sir ra rb rv ot uh, the no, last I... part sir can't understand sir no it has gone it is very simple it has gone to the pulmonary artery and pulmonary artery and pulmonary artery it has gone to the wedge position see You, if you are very careful, you can see that the tip of the catheter is not moving at all. Mm. It's comple completely fixed. So the 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 catheter has gone into the pulmonary artery wedge position. So what are the catheters that you can make use of to uh, measure the wedge wedge pressure? What is the most widely used and the best catheter? Angans is the most widely used. Angans. Angans is the simplest, but then mm. you don't go to the um, to the to the A wedge position with swan gans. Before that, you inflate the balloon, and then you get the pulmonary artery wedge pressure. But what is the catheter in which you can go up to the periphery, get uh, get the wedge pressure directly through the catheter? The multi-purpose. Multi-purpose also can be used, but the best one is Cornan catheter. Yes. Cornan catheter is the most ideal one, which is an N-hole catheter, which can be used to uh, get good um, pulmonary artery wedge pressure tracings. So this is you are right. This is a the 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 pictorial catheter is in the left ventricle, and the other catheter, which is the coronal catheter, is in the pulmonary arterial wedge position. Okay, right. Okay. Now there are a few questions. What do you mean by contractility? How do you measure contractility? You have to define contractility, and uh, you must tell me how will you measure contractility. Contractility is the intrinsic uh, uh, quality of the muscle, not dependent on uh, preload or the afterload. Very good. Contractility is defined as the intrinsic property of the cardiac muscle to contract, independent of loading conditions. Very good. Yes. So, when the contract, can you tell me few drugs which can increase the contractility, and also when the contractility increases, what is the effect on the hemodynamics? Uh, uh, inotropes. Yes, inotropic I, agents. Yes. yes. Then sir, digoxin. Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, uh, inotropic agents can increase the contractility. Okay. Um, what is the relationship between? Uh, what is the difference between contractility and force of contraction? The force of contraction is dependent on the three factors. One is contractility, hmm. and uh, sir, also the loading condition. Hmm. Uh, and uh, sir uh, the relaxation part sir what to say sir lucidity lucidity is may not be directly related to heart rate also the force of contraction is depending upon one contractility loading condition especially preload and also uh, what is the effect of uh, after load on contractility on force of contraction uh, it With increase in the half tone load, mm. the force of contraction should increase. Sir. Why should it increase? Uh, sir, no, sir. Uh, sir, with preload it will increase the force yeah. of contraction. Yes, with preload there is an increase in the force of contraction, uh, and with the half tone load, uh, 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 sometimes it may actually can depress the contractile uh, force of contraction also. The increase in heart rate can increase the force of contraction. Okay, how do you measure contractility? What is the method to measure contractility? Stroke volume. Eh? It is a, some basic things in cardiology. I think That's the mechanics of cardiology, if you know, I think that will help you to understand a lot of things. Hemodynamics. That's a bit. Hmm. Have you heard of DP or DT? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, the correct measure of the contractility is the DP or DT. Okay. Sometimes uh, some of the examiners, uh, like me, who have studied all these things, may ask a question: What is meant by contractility, and how do you measure contractility? A little more difficult question: What is after load? <clears throat> It's the load against which the heart has to contract. Very good. It is the force against which the ventricle pumps the blood, and it in, it includes what are the, the as far as the LV is concerned, after load includes systemic vascular resistance. Systemic vascular resistance. Any. Uh... Stenosis. Yes, stenosis, especially LV outflow obstruction. Yes. Compliance with aorta. Ah, yes, sir. Compliance with arteries. Viscosity of the blood. And to some extent, preload also uh, decides after load because it increases the force of contraction and also it can uh, influence the because a large volume of blood can actually to some extent increase the afterload. The blood, the quantity of blood also is part of the afterload. So our quantity of blood in the LV, quantity of blood in the aorta, all forms part of the afterload. So afterload. So afterload in all includes afterload, as you rightly said, is the the, the uh, resistance against which the uh, the ventricle, especially left ventricle, pumps the blood. It involves LV outflow obstruction, aortic uh, uh, compliance with aorta, the uh, resistance of the arteries, the peripheral vascular resistance and systemic vascular resistance, the volume of blood, then the viscosity of the blood. All these forms part of the afterload. Yes, sir. What is afterload mispatch and what is the importance? Afterload mismatch is important for the uh, surgery of regurgitant lesion. All right. Now I'm just telling first you tell me what is afterload mismatch, give an example, and then you will understand their importance. Sir, uh, afterload mismatch, sir, sub, uh, uh, sir, I will uh, explain according to the uh, patient or suppose mitral regurgitation. Mm. We, are, we have operated. So, uh, mitral regurgitation patient uh, uh, in mitral regurgitation, mm. the left ventricle is uh, contracting against the low pressure left atria. So, mm. sir, the left ventricle is not very compliant. Mm. Whereas, hey, the not compliant. What do you mean by that? Uh, no, sir. Uh, I mean, so, so, uh, as a result, in a post-operative period of a uh, mitral regurgitation patient, the mm. left ventricle may go into staging because yes. now. Uh, the LV has to pump against the aorta, which is a yeah. high pressure. Okay. Uh, there is yeah, so there is one example. But a much simpler example is that we'll go uh, afterload mismatch is the afterload mismatch is the inability of the ventricle functioning at a stable level of enotropic you know, state to maintain normal stroke volume against the altered afterload. That is a Correct definition. Afterload mismatch is the inability of the ventricle functioning at a stable level of enotropic state to maintain normal stroke volume against the altered afterload. You have, what you mentioned is also one thing. See, for example, the ventricle with mitral regurgitation was emptying part of its contents to the left atrium, which is a very low pressure zone, and part of it into the aorta. But after the after the valve replacement. Suddenly, the left ventricle has to uh, pump the whole content into the aorta, which is a much higher uh, pressure zone compared to left atrium. And so, the, some of the uh, patients can develop a afterload mismatch. Best example of afterload mismatch is that acute systolic loading of the ventricle in acute hypertension can lead to LV pump failure without myocardial dysfunction. The most important thing about uh, afterload mismatch is that when the mismatch occurs, the left ventricular function is still the same. So the left ventricular function is still the same, but the heart fails because of the mismatch. And once you correct the mismatch, for example, in a patient with acute systolic uh, pressure elevation, the patient can go immediately for an acute left ventricular failure. 
at that time the the ventricular myocardium is functioning very well without any problem but uh, but it is not able to function against the new obstruct and so if you bring down this new obstruct by treating the elevated blood pressure the heart can immediately recover and can function normally so that is the most important thing you should know that whenever there is an obstruct mismatch the, the only thing that you have to do is whatever has been the mismatch that should be correct otherwise the patient will not improve so uh, uh, you should know this definition obstruct mismatch is the inability of the ventricle functioning at a stable level of anotropic state to maintain normal stroke volume against the altered obstruct load so a patient with systemic hypertension was pumping blood normally but suddenly there was an acute rise in the uh, blood pressure and the patient uh, the, the ventricle may suddenly fail it is not because the ventricle has is not able to perform uh, uh, as it was previously performing but the obstruct is so high that the ventricle is not not able to work against that obstruct and in such a situation situation once you bring down the uh, the altered obstruct the patient can quickly recover so that's the most important thing you should remember about obstruct mismatch obstruct mismatch occurs when preload reserve is unable to compensate don't worry about the next statement uh, that's I, I will call you the obstruct mismatch occurs when preload reserve is unable to compensate usually when there is an obstruct small amount of obstruct mismatch usually what happens is that there is an increase in the preload and the heart is able to uh, uh, get over the obstruct mismatch but if the obstruct mismatch is severe and very significant then the heart will not be able to overcome the obstruct mismatch that has to be corrected so as uh, saroj has rightly said one good example is patients with mitral regurgitation when they undergo a valve replacement suddenly they are exposed to a higher uh, obstruct and if the uh, if the uh, if the how uh, if the sudden obstruct the ventricle is not able to handle then that can result in acute left ventricular failure so that's a very important point and in regular practice the best example is acute elevation of the of the systemic pressure which can suddenly re- rise to such a high level that the obstruct uh, the ventricle is not able to overcome or or perform normally and the patient goes in for acute left ventricular failure this is not any lv dysfunction but it is because of an acute obstruct mismatch and once you correct the obstruct the patient becomes all right so some basic hemodynamics and also principles of uh, obstruct preload all those things and this is uh, the toughest one what is wall stress what are the factors which can modify wall stress you must know this <clears throat> you have to define wall stress and what are the factors which can modify wall stress so, oh yes uh, i don't know the exact definition sir but it de- i mean it's described by the laplace's law okay ah uh, that's right <laughs> the factors which influence the wall stress is decided by the laplace law very good excellent before that you should say what is wall stress what is wall stress yeah wall stress is uh, directly i will give you a clue it is directly related to afterload so it's again some force against which the ventricle has to contract oh no no definition is not the force again that is afterload but uh, oh. uh, what stress is related to after load lateral, are, lateral lateral uh, pressure so it is the lateral pressure which is exerted uh, on the this is what stress it is the load on per unit of myocardium during systole it is actually on a small unit of myocardium that's the most important thing you should know what stress it is the load on per unit of myocardium during systole what stress is modified by after load lv chamber radius and heart muscle thickness applying the laplace equation what stress is equal to pr divided by 2 or muscle 2 uh, multiplied by heart muscle thickness so that is why when there is a increase in the after load increase in the what stress the compensatory mechanism is development of left ventricular hypertrophy and when the left ventricle hypertrophies the wall stress comes down because it is the load on per unit of myocardium during systole 
So unless the water stress is brought down, the uh, the, the, the the myocardium can gradually uh, develop uh, failure. So that is why the the uh, in a patient who, whose uh, afterload is significantly elevated and in whom the water stress is also significantly elevated, these patients undergo a left ventricular hypertrophy and thereby bringing down the water stress to normal so that the heart can function normally again. So water stress is inversely proportional to the, wall, the, hyper, uh, the thickness of the myocardium and directly proportional to the pressure that is the afterload as well as the, uh, the uh, LV chamber radius. As the radius increases, the water stress also increases. So the water stress can be due to pressure increase as well as due to radius increase. So in a patient with mitral regurgitation, water stress can increase uh, secondary to increase in the radius of the LV chamber also. So uh, water stress, it is the load on per unit of myocardium during systole. Water stress is modified by afterload, P, LV chamber radius, R, and heart muscle thickness, H. Applying the Laplace uh, equation, water stress is uh, proportional to the pressure in the ventricle as well as the radius of the ventricle and is inversely proportional to the thickness of the myocardium. Okay, I think we'll, uh, that is a, a difficult part of the uh, uh, today's uh, uh, discussion. I wanted for you to understand the basic things also. That is why. Okay, now we'll go to uh, some ECGs. Sir, one question, sir. Uh -huh. uh, sir, in next class, sir, what is augmentation index? Sir. Okay, okay. You want to discuss about that? Okay, right. I read, but I... We, we can discuss that. Augmentation. We can discuss that. No, no problems at all. We'll discuss that. Okay, now we'll go to some ECGs and then. Okay, what is the electrocardiogram? This is a very simple one. This is a very, very simple electrocardiogram. Any one of you can answer? LV hypertrophy. Actually, I cannot see the V6 properly. V6. Oh, V6. Uh, I think it's... Uh, oh, no, okay. There's some... Uh, the, the tracing is not very good. I agree with you. Axis is right. Right yeah, axis. Right axis. What is V1? Sir, V1 uh, sir, uh, negative, sir. Uh, S, S is prominent than R. In V1? Oh, oh, sir, V1, sir. No, V1 no. R is prominent, sir. And yeah. uh, there is LA prominence also. Yeah, so maybe sir, this is RA prominence because they're very sharp distance. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, what, uh, do you think that it can be uh, uh, LA overload also? Yes, sir. By atrial enlargement. Okay, yeah. by atrial enlargement. The lead and, to we can understand, sir. Yeah. And uh, uh, what is the pattern of the uh, QRs in V1? Sir, uh, it's a very tiny R with uh, uh, tall R back. There is a tiny R. I can't see any tiny R. Q, Q. It okay. looks more, more like a small Q with an R wave. Yes. QR, QR pattern with a, a T wave inversion. What does that indicate? This is suprasystemic pressure. Yeah, it usually indicates the, there's a QR pattern in V1 usually indicates with a strain pattern usually indicates a suprasystemic pulmonary artery pressure or the suprasystemic pressure, not pulmonary artery pressure, suprasystemic pressure in the, uh, in the left, in the right ventricle. So whenever there is a right ventricular hypertrophy with a uh, left atrial overload, what is your diagnosis? Yes, sir. Eh? Sorry. Sorry. How can you get a left atrial overload or left atrial dilatation in AST? What is the MS. condition where I get this combination left atrial overload with uh, right ventricular hypertrophy? PDA. MS. Eh? MS. Mitral stenosis, yes, very good. It is mitral stenosis. PDA, or what is the which ventricle is hypertrophy? Uh, sir, which? No, sir. Left ventricle. Left, left. left. Right ventricle is not at all involved unless the patient starts developing uh, Eisenmenger reaction, pulmonary hypertension, all those things. So, in a patient with a 
whenever you see a left sided overload pattern with right ventricular hypertrophy always think of mitral stenosis mitral stenosis mitral stenosis is the condition in which you get this combination and here this patient may be having some degree of tricuspid regurgitation also because this patient has got biatrial enlargement okay, we'll go to mm. next one okay what is this electrocardiogram slightly more difficult is there a avid dissociation sir there is avid dissociation and along with that intermittent capture bit also yeah that is right this is a capture changing sir this is a capture bit and uh, this is a capture bit how will you what uh, if the patient is having a rhythm in between there is a capture bit how will you uh, suddenly recognize a capture bit morphology will be similar to uh, qrs the regular qrs and uh, but it will be premature sir it will be premature uh, i mean it will premature okay. early occurring qrs will be the one uh, which will indicate to you that it is a capture b when it is a uh, uh, when it is a late occurring what is it called if a beat is occurring early then you capture b if a beat is occurring late If, if it is a <clears throat> in a rhythm strip if you are a, if you get a rhythm strip and the, uh, it is a having a regular rhythm but in between one beat is occurring early and that uh, you should suspect that it could be a capture beat and look for it similarly in a rhythm uh, which is regular uh, you find that one beat is late and then what is that beat that usually indicates you should think about a capture beat Not capture bit. Um, it is a escape bit. Capture bit is an early bit, and escape bit is a late bit. So, the, what is the basic rhythm in this patient? Is it an abnormal in inverse formation or an abnormal in inverse conduction? I will you make out whether whether a arrhythmia is due to an abnormal in inverse formation or an abnormal in inverse conduction? in a rhythm strip if there is an arrhythmia how will you make out whether it is an abnormal in inverse formation or is it an abnormal in inverse conduction any one of you that's a very simple question if you look at the uh, atrial rate and the ventricular rate that will give you number of yes in case of if number of p waves are more if number of p waves are more then uh, sinus uh, sinus node is functioning and av node is not conducting if uh, p waves are not there then the sinus node is not functioning that way no no p wave is there p and qrs are, are there sir so if the pp interval is constant hmm. then it indicates that the impulse formation is uh, is being done is is correctly happening no no can you be certain pp interval can be uh, regular from an ectopic focus also okay okay when will you uh, by looking at the pp interval and uh, rr interval how will you detect whether this is an abnormal in impulse formation or abnormal in impulse conduction so if pp interval is shorter then it is a, a conduction defect Uh, what did you say so if, if p pp interval is shorter than the rr interval oh. then it is a conduction defect very good if the uh, pp uh, pp uh, uh, atrial rate is more than the ventricular rate it is abnormal in inverse conduction and if the ventricular rate is more than the if the ventricular rate is uh, uh, more than the atrial rate it is an abnormal in inverse formation 
Okay, here is it abnormality in impulse conduction or an abnormality in impulse formation? Sir, impulse formation is defective here. Yes, why? Sir, because here PP interval is longer than the RR interval. Very good. The PP interval is longer than the RR interval. So here is an abnormality in impulse formation. Not in conduction. Okay, right. And also intermittently you can see that he's having a, a conducted beat also. You can see this is a conducted beat. Is it a winky back sinus? No, 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 no. It's not winky back. Winky back is an abnormality in impulse what? Sir, you have been answering correctly, but then you went out of the way. Abnormality in uh, winky back is what? Is it abnormality in impulse formation? Conduction, conduction. 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 So you said that this is an abnormality in impulse formation. Then sir, how can you say it's winky back? Yes, sir. So this is a sinus node dysfunction, uh, sinus pause or sinus exit block. So here PP interval is six. So, so uh, possibly it is an exit block, not a pause. <laughs> no, you don't have to create all complex uh, uh, diagnosis. See, here if the patient is having, a, definitely the patient is having an abnormality in impulse uh, formation because his uh, ventricular rate is more than the atrial rate. Is, is it a, uh, if the ventricular focus, is it in the ventricle or a supraventricular focus? Supraventricular. Supraventricular focus. Why did you say supraventricular focus? Narrow QRS. <clears throat> the QRS is narrow. It's narrow QRS complex. Since the QRS complex is narrow, it is a uh, impulse is formed supra, supra, uh, supraventricular focus. And common supraventricular focus that we think about is in and in, in, in around the AV junction. So this could be a junctional focus uh, controlling the ventricle. And intermittently there is a conducted. Uh, there is a conducted bit. This is a conducted bit. This is a conducted bit. This is a conducted bit. So intermittently there you are getting a conducted bit. And uh, uh, since the, what is the uh, this rate? This rate is around 1, 2, 3, Maybe around uh, 80 or 90. So you can even say that it is a slow ventricular rhythm, slow uh, uh, junctional rhythm, because it's a, it's a slow rate. But the, the impulse is being formed from the supraventricular focus, and that is controlling the ventricle. While the impulse coming from, uh, maybe from the sinus node, is uh, not is intermittently being conducted to the ventricle, but uh, it's not regularly controlling the ventricular rhythm. So there is an abnormality in impulse formation. And most likely it is a, it is a junctional slow tachycardia. Uh, excuse me, sir. Oh. Uh, sir, can we just once discuss uh, the difference between AV dissociation and complete heart? AV dissociation, complete heart block. AV dis complete heart block is an AV dissociation. AV dissociation means that the atrium and the ventricle are beating independently. Independently, yes. So, uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia is an AV dissociation. Yes, sir. Huh. So, the junctional tachycardia with the retrograde block is an AV dissociation. Huh. So, there are plenty of conditions where there can be atrium and the ventricle are be beating independently of each other. While Right, sir. And complete heart block also is an AV dissociation and also uh, is because the atrium and the ventricle are beating independently. But here the ventricular, ventricular rate is much lower than the atrial rate. Mm -hmm. While other conditions like junctional tachycardia with retrograde block or the ventricular tachycardia with no retrograde conduction, all these are conditions where the ventricular rate is much faster than the atrial rate and they are beating oh. in the independently. Right. Is it okay. clear to you? Yes, yes. Yes. So here, the uh, patient is having AV, you cannot say complete AV dissociation. There is AV dissociation with the intermittent capture because the atrium and the ventricle are independently functioning, but occasionally there is a capture beat. Whenever there is an early beat, you should carefully look for whether it is a capture beat. But when the beat becomes late, you should think whether it is a escape beat. So in a rhythm strip, an early bit, you should carefully look for a capture bit. And in a rhythm strip, there is a bit dissociation. There is a late bit. You should look for, uh, you should consider whether this could be a escape bit. Okay, right. We'll go to the next one. This is uh, relatively simple. Should not have any problem. Not very straightforward, but relatively simple.
then you should suspect that there may be associated uh, right posterior fasciculum block also as in this case so very good uh, sir very good diagnosis so this is a, a patient with trifasicular block can you uh, can anyone of you tell me a few conditions in the electrocardiogram where you can diagnose trifasicular block three or four we have discussed it many times three or four uh, electrocardiographic uh, surface electrocardiographic uh, findings which will tell you that the patient is having a trifasicular block one of course see this here right bundle branch block with the left posterior hemi block and first degree heart block three more we can have a rbvv plus lafv and yes. prolonged pr very good uh, actually left complete left bundle branch block can be considered as a bifascicular that is bifascicular not trifascicular Al along with pr interval prolongation yes but studies have shown that when you get that combination you are right that uh, uh, lbbb with the first degree heart block can also be considered but studies have shown that in in such situations in 80% of the cases the first degree heart block is due to a conduction delay at the av node oh. only in 20% that this is due to an abnormality in the third fascicle which is the right bundle branch but that can be considered but the, the, if you take the uh, total number of cases where you find an lbbb with first degree heart block usually only 20% are uh, trifascicular block 20% 80% the block is in the avian okay right yes the alternate bundle branch block very good yes one more and then we'll go to the next one right bundle branch block with alternating left anterior fasciculum block and left posterior fasciculum block that is a, another situation where what is the relevance of this type why why, do you, why are you worried about right fasciculum block anyone of you so these patient will go in uh, uh, high high grade block and will need pacemaker sir yeah these patients uh, it usually indicates that they have got all, all the three fasciculars are in trouble mm -hmm. it's uh, an advanced advanced disease Yeah, so the, there is a possibility that these patients can develop a complete heart block and may develop uh, symptoms related to that. So you should caution the patient that uh, if you develop any giddiness or blackout, please come to the hospital so that we are evaluating. So a trifascicular block is potentially uh, at risk of developing complete heart block. They need not. Some of the patients with trifascicular block may continue to uh, be in that in that stable situation for many years, maybe ten years, fifteen years, twenty years. so immediately you need not say that you are to undergo a pacemaker implantation but if the patient is developing symptoms yes then okay what is the electrocardiogram when you see an electrocardiogram you should immediately look at the p wave uh, pr rate and all the edu ventricular rhythm with the mi in the last part we can see the st elevation sir yes very good so this is a case of accelerated edu ventricular accelerated edu ventricular rhythm in a patient with this will lead to what type of infarction which ward yes sir interior valve sir 
ഇതിനെ <laughs> of the st segment so this may be a p a p wave this is another p wave this is another p wave so on top of the uh, the accelerated ed ventricular rhythm the patient is having 2 to 1 block also then it's a complete diagnosis that is slightly difficult so that uh, if you have to be very careful to look at here this you can see a p wave here there's a p wave here there's a p here and some p wave here there's another p here and this p wave is uh, uh, of course got conducted and there is additional p here and 2 to 1 blow so complete diagnosis uh, accelerated ventricular ventricular rhythm inferior myocardial infarction with 2 to 1 blow so do you understand the 2 to 1 blow uh, saroj yes sir yes sir okay right yes. so that's a complete diagnosis okay this is similar arrhythmia sir little more difficult when uh, but uh, if this is not an arrhythmia so it it must be easier for you any one of you ronak i am not uh, uh, why can't you try gorav yes sir yes sir ha oh. this is the electrocardiogram of a 3 month old baby that should give you the clue yes cats watchful phenomenon it's known as cats watchful phenomenon and what is it actually you have to describe what is it when you call it a cats watchful phenomenon it's bivariate rs rs equiphasic in it's a v1 to v6 yes now v2 to v4 to v sometimes v2 to v5 large equiphasic uh, deflections from v2 to v5 indicating biventricular uh, 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 hypertrophy and that is suggestive of uh, ventricular septal defect and this is known as cats watchful phenomenon and if the total of the r plus cs is more than 45 mm that definitely indicates the biventricular involvement what is the type of involvement in uh, in vst uh, what is the type of involvement of the ventricle, right ventricle and what is the type of involvement of the left ventricle what is the hemodynamic involvement of the left ventricle and right ventricle in vst one ventricle so one can put the pressure over another yes left ventricle volume right ventricle pressure very good uh, the, the left ventricle is volume overloaded and the right ventricle is pressure overloaded even though there is a shunt the the shunt shunting takes place from the lv to rv during systole and hence uh, the left ventricle right ventricle does not get volume overloaded the left ventricle is get volume overloaded and right ventricle is pressure overloaded okay right fine good yes uh, excuse me sir excuse ah. me sir there yes. was q in 2 uh, 3 uh, and avf so we can just, uh, say it is a counter clockwise loop or not to comment it is not a counter clockwise loop Because, uh, so, uh, so clockwise q in lead 2 3 and avf q wave is there there is a small q in lead 2 so you have to draw and find out whether there is a what is the how the uh, this is a standard vst so why not the drawn that uh, uh, loop so uh, to loop uh, q in lead 3 does not always mean that it is counter clockwise it can be still clockwise also avl uh, no no avl avf is also and lead to 3 wave there is a q wave so initially it is coming uh, with uh, towards the 
uh, it is away from away from the uh, uh, to the area it is going up so it can still be a, a clockwise loop it's going up first and then coming around into the lower portion and then it is uh, getting back i don't think it is a uh, uh, anti clockwise loop it is a clockwise loop okay this is simpler so there should not be any difficulty we can at least tell the uh, uh, staring diagnosis and to that to the mile sir and to that to the mile we have with ft elevation in v2 to v6 and to that to the mile yes there is an and uh, and you were my garden function yes what is so mid led sir is that wrap around the led is mid hmm distal to d1 sir distal to d1 A V L is the uh, one is elevated, so may, uh, actually uh, uh, diagonal is involved. But there is no S T elevation in A V R. So it's it's a lead, it's a lead two and A V F is also elevated, so it is uh, mid L A D or the wrap along the L A D. So that is L A D is very. It is causing the uh, L A D may be large, but. Uh, Uh, somebody was making a comment about the relationship of the occlusion uh, from uh, S1 and D1. It is here uh, S1 is spared because uh, AVR is not showing any ST elevation, and there is ST elevation in lead one, and to some extent probably AVL also is convex. So that indicates that probably the the uh, the D1 is involved. Distal to septal septal branch, but proximal to D1. Yeah, proximal to D1, but distal to the septal branch. S1 is spared. Anything more? Any question? There is someone. Lead two is recorded here. Do anybody wants to make a comment about that? Yeah, it looks like. Yeah, it looks like this. Our sir, our PR is uh, depressed than the sorry. atrial involvement, sir. Atrial infarction. Yeah, no. You can also diagnose atrial infarction, or it may also indicate pericardial pericarditis. Also, atrial infarction. Also, I agree with you that there can be a PR segment uh, variation, uh, but uh, uh, most more commonly it is seen associated with uh, because uh, uh, in a patient with uh, LAD disease, atrial infarction is very unlikely because okay. LAD can go anywhere near the atrium. So okay. whenever you are seeing a ST depression. in uh, lead to especially pr not st pr depression then in a patient with anterior mag infarction you can think of the possibility of pericarditis so this is a patient with anterior mag infarction distal to s1 and has got associated pericarditis and uh, this uh, pr segment will be measured will be compared with what segment to diagnose uh, uh, pericarditis pp segment tp segment it should be compared with the tp segment and then only you can diagnose uh, pericarditis here you can see that compared to pt segment uh, it is depressed and that indicates there is associated pericarditis or atrial infarction but a patient with a led disease unlikely that the atrium will be involved okay This should be simple for you. Complete heart block, sir. Complete heart block. Yes. Obviously, the patient is having AV dissociation. Now, what are the four points for diagnosis of complete heart block? The PP interval is six. RR interval is six. There is no relation between the P and R. And sir, PP interval is shorter than the RR interval. Very good. There are four points by which you diagnose complete heart block. Sir, uh, the PP interval is regular. RR interval is regular. 
the P, P R interval goes on changing or there is no relationship between P and the R wave and the P rate is more than the R rate. Okay, right. Very good. Excellent. Is it an inferior volume? I also said the last case, the last case. Next, uh, yes, sir. Inferior volume, sir. Yes, sir. Last case, sir. No, no, no. Where is the lead to ST elevation? First, second, third. Fourth, fourth, uh, fourth complex ST is... One, two, three, four. No, that is because there is a T so superimposed on the ST segment. Here there is a T wave. Oh, so this is a P wave, sorry. This is a P wave, which is superimposed on the ST segment. So this is not ST elevation. You can see the ST is all isoelectric here. It's good to uh, think of that possibility, but here we don't have any clue to diagnose in here on function. Here, this uh, whatever you are seeing here is actually a P wave which is falling on the part of the ST segment. So it's not ST elevation. So this is a case of the complete heart block. There is uh, no doubt about the, you know, and I am not able to diagnose inferior myocardial infarction because there is no clue to diagnose inferior myocardial infarction. I agree with you that whenever there is a uh, complete heart block with a narrow QRS complex, a possibility of inferior myocardial infarction uh, uh, with associated complete heart block should be uh, uh, should be in your mind. But in the electrocardiogram, this electrocardiogram does not have any clue to diagnose associated inferior myocardial infarction. Diagnosis. The atrial fibrillation with pre existing bundle, left bundle branch block. Very good. It is atrial fibrillation with the left bundle branch block. So you can see the left bundle branch block here and it is irregular. And the commonest cause of irregular rhythm is atrial fibrillation. You can see it, it here also it is quite irregular. So this is a case of left bundle branch block with uh, atrial fibrillation. Many times when we see a a broad QRS complex, we have got a tendency to diagnose ventricular tachycardia. But you should carefully look for whether whether the rhythm is regular, whether you can see the P waves, and then only you tell the diagnosis. Uh, tell me a few conditions where you can get a, a broad QRS complex. Conditions where you can get broad QRS complex. The ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia. Sir, uh, antidromic. Uh... You are right, endodromic. AVRT. AVRT. Endodromic AVRT, very good. SVT with aberrancy. SVT with aberrancy. SVT with aberrancy, excellent. And atrial fibrillation with a pre existing bundle branch block, atrial fibrillation with in a patient with WPW syndrome, all can have broad QRS complex. There are only, in general, there are only four situations when you see a broad QRS complex. They are, one, the origin from the, the impulses originating from the ventricle. Two, bundle branch block. Three, pinky back phenomenon. Four, uh, sorry, uh, WPW syndrome. And fourth, any one of you, broad QRS. I have mentioned three, which are easier. And the fourth one is, Nuro, would you like to make a comment? What is the fourth cause of broad QRS complex? In hyperkalemia also you can get broad yes. QRS. So the, whenever you see a broad QRS complex, first of all, you think about four conditions. One, the impulse is arising from the ventricle. Two, pre-existing bundle branch block or bundle branch block. Three, WPW, four, hyperkalemia. And a fifth one also is there. Uh, some of the drugs can give rise to broadening of the QRS complex. Can anyone of you mention one or two drugs which can actually, when it toxic levels, that's can cause broadening of the QRS Dioxin, sir. Dioxin. No, no. Dioxin cannot. Tricyclic anti pardon? Tricyclic antidepressants. No, I, I could not get you. Can you speak loud? Tricyclic antidepressants, sir. I don't know whether it can give rise to broad QRS complex. They can give rise to QT prolongation. Order. 
it is a class 1 a and a is mixed sodium channel sodium channel yeah, yeah, sodium channel block sodium channel block is quinidine uh, then to some more uh, quinidine is most notorious quinidine can give rise to broadening of the qrs complex previously when uh, quinidine was in use sometimes we used to keep quinidine before and before giving quinidine we used to record an electrocardiogram and if the qrs complex Uh, broadens by more than 50% of the pre quinidine level then there is an indication to stop quinidine because the patient can go on for quinidine toxicity and can develop proarrhythmia so uh, there is nowadays it is not being used so that is not a, an important reason for a broad qrs complex so uh, as far as you are concerned there are four causes for broad qrs complex which we have already mentioned ventricular origin of the impulse bundle branch block wpw syndrome and hyperkalemia right okay sir here can we sir sir one sir excuse yes, me sir sir in last ecg can we comment there is lb dysfunction also sir because qs is there or cardiomyopathy is under uh, underlying cardiomyopathy is there leading on to no no he is atrial fibrillation obviously means he has got a, a basic heart disease because atrial fibrillation Very rarely, accepting uh, as a low atrial fibrillation, almost always occurs associated with heart disease. And he is having a bundle branch block. Both both are uh, electrocardiographic abnormalities, which can be seen in patients with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So I fully agree with you that patient may be having uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, and uh, uh, the ECG abnormalities may indicate that. But uh, i will not dare to diagnose that on, on just because of that only if the examiner asks you can always give a comment saying that because of this uh, uh, atrial fibrillation plus a left bundle branch block a possible it is possible that patient may be having an elvitis function and may be having dilated cardiomyopathy also okay right okay what is this this is slightly difficult avr avl avf is not there but uh, rest of the things are enough for, for you to make the diagnosis sir af with complete heart block very good that part is right af with complete heart block excellent very good what else very good diagnosis okay. he is having a atrial fibrillation with complete heart block the that is based only on v1 sir other leads are not very right eh? the that is based on v1 v1 is showing a of with complete heart block sir other leads uh, they are single only sir so the nodal nodal uh, rhythm sir uh, in the the p waves are seen after the qrs when the person you are getting the rhythms to which shows in atrial fibrillation but you want Why do you want to go to the uh, say uh, it is of the same patient and the rhythm strip is shown here that shows uh, atrial fibrillation with complete heart block. Otherwise, it's already diagnosed it. I it want you, I want others to diagnose uh, diagnose what is in the in the uh, uh, the short strip is we you know, of the lead two, lead three, uh, lead one, lead two, lead three, uh, V one two, V six. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Hypokalemia. Who said that? What is your name? Sir, uh, Karun Khanna, sir. Uh, yes. Where, where are you? Where are you working? I am uh, currently in residency in KPV College, uh, Trichy, okay. sir. And why, why did you diagnose hypokalemia? Because of the prominent U waves. Prominent in the U waves, and body. also the uh, if you consider till the end of the U wave, <laughs> good prolongation of the QT interval. And uh, can you make further diagnosis? What may be the lesion, and uh, why he has developed a complete heart block? This electrolyte demia itself may be the cause. Yes, sir. The hypokalemia. Uh, the hypokalemia giving rise to complete heart block is very unlikely. Be on do you? Okay. Yeah, very good. The, he may be on digoxin. He may be on digoxin, and hypokalemia might have caused the uh, the uh, complete heart block. Uh, both combination might have resulted in complete heart block. And what may be the lesion? Do you want to make a guess work? Is it an LV dominant or I or RV dominant? Yeah, LV dominant. LV dominant. And LV dominant with uh, atrial fibrillation. Sir, mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation. That's very good. Excellent. The full diagnosis: patient with hypokalemia, 
the complete heart block, atrial fibrillation, NV dominant, most likely uh, having mitral regurgitation, and he was on digoxin, and that has resulted in complete heart block. Very good. Yes. Uh, sir, one doubt here, sir. Sir, that uh, shall we take is that a U wave or it is the uh, lead to that is after T, that uh, is not very. You, uh, no, no, you can, uh, you can, uh, one method, if you are in doubt what the one method is to, you can measure a, le a lead where U wave is not seen, only a flat T wave is seen, lead one, flat T wave. So you can, yes. the distance from the beginning of the QR is complex to the end of that wave. And then you try to find out where it, where it uh, ends and whether the, the second um, wave, what you are seeing, is it an abnormal wave or not. Here we have measured it. And it's actually it's a U wave. I think uh, this is U wave. This is a U wave. This is a U. U waves are best seen in mid precordial leads. So U waves are sign of ischemia also, sir. Somewhere. I... And when, when when do you diagnose ischemia in, uh, uh, with the U wave? What is the situation? And what do you what do you what you should see in U wave? What you should see? To diagnose ischemia. In flattened U wave. No, I am not absent. Inverted U wave. Inverted Especially yes. if you are doing a treadmill and you find that before the treadmill, uh, initiation of the treadmill, the patient has got upright U waves. And then during treadmill or after the treadmill, his U wave becomes inverted. That is an indication that he may be having extensive coronary disease. So U wave. In LMC, they are telling, sir, LMC, I think that is left main or LED. I don't know whether you can directly consider left main, but it usually indicates extensive disease. Left main may be also part of a process in which there is extensive involvement, but it need not be left main, multivessel disease involvement. So T T U wave can be looked at before the T uh, before you subject the patient for treadmill, and after the treadmill or during the process, if the patient develops T U wave inversion, there is an indication of a positive treadmill and also uh, indicates. Uh, extensive coronary involvement. Okay. What is this rhythm to indicate? What is the diagnosis? Thank you, back. Not bring you back. Not correct. Should I describe, sir? The fifth, yeah. beat, the fifth beat is coming early. What? So the fifth beat, huh. number five, the beat is coming early, sir. And sir, uh, there is a uh, P wave not conducted, most probably, sir, after the... Uh, yeah, you're right, you're right. You're right. Uh, after the ninth, ninth beat, P wave is not conducted. Okay. So... Uh, what, what does that mean? Why the PV is not conducted? But again, right. same thing is happening after, sir, again, four weeks. So yeah. the P waves are intermittently yeah. not conducted, sir. Yeah. This is actually a topic P wave. This also so this is come in the uh, period uh, when the ventricle uh, AV load is reflected. Yes. So then, why there is a gap here? Sir, because sir, the next P wave has uh, come, the, at that time the uh, ventricle is refractory. That is right. But why there is a gap here? Because this is the regular R interval and this is a longer R interval. The, he, again, here also is longer R interval. Non conducted P wave, sir. Uh, P wave is not conducted, but that will not explain this long PR interval, the long, long R interval. When this P wave is, what is it? This is an early P wave which is not conducted to the ventricles. So, what is this P wave doing? Sir, it is going back the, to the, the, 
pacemaker. Yeah, it is depolarizing the sinus node and resetting it. That will that has resulted in a pause here. So the 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 blocked atrial ectopy does not produce a chorus complex, but it resets the sinus node, and so there is a RR interval is prolonged. So this is an early occurring atrial ectopy, which is non not conducted to the ventricle because it occurred at a time when the AV AV node and the bundle of is all are refractory, but it moved up into the sinus node and reset the sinus node. So there is a PR the RR interval is prolonged. Okay, good. Okay, exergist. Describe and diagnosis. Well, actually, just PA view. Uh, oh. So there is a marked cardiomegaly. Hmm. So the apex is possibly for RV type. Hmm. Uh, maybe RV type. Anyhow, yeah. uh, I would just say that I can't make comment whether RV or LV, but uh, uh, if you somebody says RV type, I may not disagree on that point. The pulmonary okay, right. artery, uh, the pulmonary bay is full. That's Don't use the way. pulmonary bay is full. You can say pulmonary artery segment is prominent. Yes, prominent That's that, sir, right pulmonary artery is dilated. Okay. Sir, RA enlargement. Very good. The MPA and RPA both are enlarged, sir. Okay. And there's PVH there's also, pulmonary venous hypertension is also there. Yes. Why did you say permanent venous hypertension? Right side. Uh... Well, permanent venous hypertension is actually cephalization where the upper low veins must be more prominent than the lower low veins. I agree with you that you are seeing upper low, upper low vessel. Yeah, probably. Only on the right side, sir. No, see, uh, see, whenever there is a prominent pulmonary artery segment, what are the causes of prominent pulmonary artery segment? The fat is left to right, sir. Okay, increased flow. One is increase in the flow, second is increase in pressure. Three pressure also. Oh. The pulmonary artery hypertension without any, you know, any due to any reason can give rise to prominent pulmonary artery segment. Then uh, post aortic dilatation and idiopathic dilatation oh, of the yeah. pulmonary artery. Whenever you, whenever you find that the pulmonary artery segment is prominent, you have to think of one of the four. Whether there is an increased flow as can occur in left right shunt lesions, increase in the pressure of any patients with pulmonary artery hypertension due to any cause. Third, post aortic dilatation as can occur in patients with pulmonary stenosis and fourth, idiopathic dilatation of the pulmonary artery. So in this patient, uh, how will you diagnose uh, uh, shunt lesion by looking at the x-ray? And end on view, we have to see. Yes, we have to see. Yes, you can see. Yes, you can see a lot, plenty of vessels. What is the, how many end on uh, uh, vessels? Three, one lung field and five in two. Two, yes. If you can see more than three in one lung field, and more than equal to or more than five in both lung fields put together, that is enough to diagnose increase in the pulmonary vascularity. So here that you can see an endron muscle here, you can see endron muscle here. There are multiple endron muscles, so there is no doubt about that. So the patient is having a left to right shunt lesion. And where is the level of the shunt? The ASD, sir. Why did you say it's ASD? Sir, uh, RS enlarged. Uh, and also, sir, uh, I cannot see the uh, aorta enlargement. And, uh, yes, okay. So, uh, you, uh, yes, even a patient with a uh, uh, lesion with plenty of uh, endron vessels, if you see RS enlarged and there is also a cardiac enlargement, most likely it is ASD. If the patient is having a, a, a evidence of a shunt lesion and the pulmonary, uh, the, the, uh, the aorta is enlarged, that is more likely to be patent ductus arteriosus. 
if in a patient with translation both are not seen then it is most likely to be a ventricular septal defect okay so this is a case of uh, left to right shunt uh, in a patient with atrial septal defect can you comment on rvh leading on to cardiomegaly or no 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 uh, uh, no no uh, what is the evidence how do you diagnose uh, uh, in a patient with uh, uh, asd if they develop heart failure which ventricle is failing which ventricle fails hero lv lv sir lv asd ിയർസ്റ്റ്രിയർവേ <laughs> 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 These are the two wings that you can look at to diagnose. Here there is no evidence of superior vena cava at all. So there is no uh, evidence from the XHS for you to diagnose the patient is having associated RV failure. Correct, yes. Okay. Any more injuries? Ronak, why don't you try? Yes, sir. Uh, XHS is very... your voice is broken i am not able to hear you very well i need is uh, not my network is very poor sir today oh i see oh, oh so then somebody else if the, uh, for you to discuss you should uh, upgrade your network because otherwise we may not be able to understand what you are talking and there cannot be a complete discussion Okay, anybody else would like to give a comment? COPD, sir. Tubular heart COPD. COPD? Tubular heart. Is it, is it a tubular heart or you are seeing projections? No, sir. Sir, it is also an uh, uh, increased uh, um, flow of blood. ഇവന്റ് <laughs> so you are seeing Prominent pulmonary artery segment, left atrial appendage, and what are these things? Then the left atria. They are pulmonary venous type. So pulmonary uh, veins are prominent. Yes, so upper lobe vessels are very prominent compared to on the left side. They are very prominent, and here also you can see multiple uh, upper lobe veins are very prominently seen. Yes. Hmm. the mitral stenosis mitral stenosis what are the x ray evidence of pulmonary venous hypertension sir uh, okay yes what are the uh, x ray features of uh, pulmonary venous hypertension sir upper lobe vessels yeah upper lobe vessels become prominent yes very good the curly's b line curly's b line curly's a line both both are important a, a, b are more frequently seen b, a line also is important yes have you heard of peribronchial cuffing peribronchial cuffing 
any one of you what is peribronchial coughing so the, uh, the bronchus accompanying the, uh, the pulmonary arteries are dead the uh, leucines translucent and uh, signs will be uh, one and a half time that of the no 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 uh, the peribronchial coughing is uh, when you look at the bronchus if you can see the cut uh, the cut shadow of the bronchus the bronchial wall becomes edematous and you can see white white shadow fluffy shadow surrounding the uh, the 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 air shadow of the bronchus for example here there is a bronchial shadow you can see the air shadow here yes sir and surrounding that there is a white material white uh, why it's there is a, it seems that there is some white shadow seen all around that that type of a shadow if it is fluffy also that indicates there is there is a peribronchial coughing this is not a very good uh, there is some suspicion the river two stage sign the river two stage sign yeah this is a this is a, uh, there is someone very good uh, uh, yes. peribronchial coughing here so the the x ray evidence of increase in the pulmonary venous pressure one upper low vessel prominence very bronchial coughing curly a lines b lines then what is that thing appearance and plural effusion yeah there can be uh, before that you can put it as uh, ground glass appearance on the lung field then uh, uh, fluffy shadows is suggestive of pulmonary edema uh, alveolar edema uh, mostly in the, uh, it suggests a batwing appearance and these patients sometimes can have associated pleural effusion also so what are what are curly b lines what are curly a lines the curly b line are seen at the base and yeah. they... in the low in the lower portion yeah. of the uh, 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 perpendicular to, to, to reach the periphery so here actually if you are very careful you can see few lines i don't know whether you can see or not there are few lines here uh, they are usually seen in the lower part of the lung field towards the periphery and they are horizontal lines and these are due to what edema of the septal septal thickness yes yeah, it is due to alveolar septal edema the the, the septal so, so, separating the alveoli slightly becomes edematous and that is the one which gives rise to curly b lines and curly a line is also due to same mechanism and curly a lines are ones which are radiating from the hilum so there is a possibility that this may be a curly a line I'm not certain curly a lines are more difficult they, are, they actually radiate from the hilum it go in all directions so what is the pulmonary uh, left atrial pressure in this patient More than twenty-four. More than twenty-four. Yeah, when uh, the patient is having upper lower vessel prominent, usually it is fifteen to twenty. And if there is a associated peri bronchial coughing, also it will be twenty to twenty-five. And if the patient has got edema, uh, uh, pulmonary edema. if it is a acute pulmonary edema it is usually about 25 and if it is a chronic condition like in a patient with chronic mitral stenosis developing uh, pulmonary venous pressure and pulmonary edema it may be uh, the pulmonary left atrial pressure may be higher than 30 mm so in general you can say that if the patient is having upper low vessel, vessel prominent it will be around 18 to 20 if the peribronchial coughing is there it may be anywhere between 23 to 25 If the patient is having edema of the uh, the pulmonary edema it can be anywhere between 25 to 30 or even higher than 30 if an x ray chest is shown which shows pulmonary venous hypertension examiners are definitely going to ask you what will be the left atrial pressure so you should be very clear that left atrial pressure in a patient with upper low vessel prominence will be around 80 uh, around 18 20 and if the peribronchial coughing it will be 20, 23 to 25 around 22 to 25 and if the patient is having frank pulmonary edema more than 25 and many times more than 30 okay is it clear any doubt about the left atrial pressure by looking at the uh, well, uh, the uh, x ray chest 
and looking at the pulmonary evidence of pulmonary venous hypertension. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Okay, diagnosis. Uh, sir, P. Eisenmenger, Eisen. Very good, excellent. Why did you say that? Uh, sir, uh, there is a uh, peripheral uh, in uh, bilateral peripheral pruning. Uh, yes, there is a peripheral, uh, peripheral pruning uh, indicates that there is a large pulmonary, pulmonary left or right pulmonary artery with peripheral cutoff, mm -hmm. indicate pulmonary artery hypertension. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, then uh, aortic knuckle is prominent. Very good. Uh, dilated. Prominent aortic knuckle, excellent. Yes. Then pulmonary uh, artery, and uh, there is no uh, there is no cardiomegaly. Oh, that the patients with the uh, Asenmenger syndrome may not have cardiac enlargement. Yes. Uh, that's why why did you diagnose PDA? And uh, that term calcification, sir. Yeah, very good. That's a calcification. See, you can see the PDA is calcified here. You can see calcified PDA. Other things are right. There's a prominent, uh, there's a permanent uh, the, uh, the right permanent is huge and is uh, cut off. And then, but the only disadvantage in this patient is that I am not able to see significant end rod vessels. So I got a difficulty in diagnosing uh, straight that there is a, it is an Eisenmenger syndrome. The, uh, the, the iota is very prominent. All those things are there. But the presence of a calcified uh, PDA makes the diagnosis simple. So is, this is the classical site where you can get calcified PDA. Can you see yes. this very clearly? Keep in mind that whenever you see in a patient with severe pulmonary artery hypertension features and iota is prominent, always look for calcification of the duct. And calcified ductus uh, indicates that the patient is having Eisenmenger syndrome. So carefully see the uh, duct calcification. This is the duct calcification. This is uh, uh, going to the uh, uh, or rather going from the iota to the pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery. Diagnosis. The calcification is seen. Yes, very good. So most probably AV group. Okay. Or may do you think that it can be in the in the mitral analysis? Yes, sir. No. Okay. So what is the calcification? Dense calcification. The mitral annular calcification. Very good. It is mitral annular calcification. In a lateral view, how will you find out uh, where, where are these? Which where is which is right ventricle, which is left ventricle? And sir, right ventricular uh, dilate uh, dilatation, sir. Uh, uh, Substernal. There is no gap between uh, uh, pericardium and uh, sternal border. So it's a right ventricular uh, dilatation. Uh, usually, uh, usually the right ventricle can touch the. Uh, the sternum in its uh, lower two two no. segments, but if the if it is touching more than lower two segments, then you have to suspect that there may be a right ventricular right. dilatation. I am not certain about the right ventricular dilatation because there is no gross uh, dilatation mm -hmm. on the right ventricle. But how will you make up? Where are the chambers? The simplest method is you can draw a line from the lower part of the uh, cardiac cellet where it touches the sternum, hmm. draw a line towards the hilum of the lung. This is the hilum of the lung. So draw a line. Hmm. And then the, the chambers above the line are the right, right side of the chambers and the chambers below the line are the left side of the chambers. And then you divide this half into two. So you draw another line here. It divides the, uh, the upper half into two. And you also draw a line here, which divides the lower half into two. The one which is above is the atrium, and the one below is the ventricle. So I'll repeat in a lateral view, you will draw a line from the lowermost part of the cardiac cellet, where it touches the sternum, 
Shiva is the high level of the lung. And that divides the heart into two chambers, two portions. The upper portion is the right side of the chambers and the lower portion is the left side of the chambers. Then these two halves can be divided into two uh, at its middle. And the upper one is the atrium and the lower one is the ventricle. So here, if you take a, draw a line from here to here, somewhere here, and then you divide into two. So this is the left atrium, this is the right left ventricle. And at the junction of these two is the densely calcified structure. So that indicates that this is a mitral annulus calcification, uh, very dense calcification. It may be uh, calcification here, the AV grew also, I cannot say no, but it can most commonly, whenever you see a, a calcification in this region, it would be mitral annulus calcification. Okay. Diagnosis is simple, usually there should not be any problem. Tetralogy of Pello. It's a classic, uh, easy to diagnose. You can see the uh, the upturned uh, apex, uh, the foreign boat, and you can see the pulmonary segment is uh, actually, it's a bay there, there's no prominence. I have to style the prominent. So all put together, it's a case of tetralogy of Pello. So that's uh, easy to understand. Okay, right, okay. Anybody wants to ask any, give, give any comments or any, any questions to be asked? Okay. This is the x-ray of a, a newborn baby, two days old baby. Two days old baby, x-ray. Very good. That's a cardiac enlargement. The baby is cyanosed. TGA, sir. TGA. Why did you say TGA? The ground glass appearance is seen, sir, and cardiomegaly is present, and the prominent. So the patient is, uh, I said, the patient is blue. And you can see increased pulmonary blood flow. You can see endone vessels. Mm -hmm. There is a, uh, what do you see normally in a, a baby, in two day old baby? What, do, what is the structure you see here? Thymus. Thymus. Absence of thymus indicates there is a major cardiovascular disease. And the common situation where the thymus can disappear in the entire plane life itself is a, trunkus, a, a, a transposed of late arteries. And so very often you see an narrow pedicle. And sometimes this uh, appearance is described as egg on side. Egg on side appearance. Is, uh, the, uh, this is the uh, larger part of the egg, and this is, uh, this is the smaller part of the egg. So, egg on side appearance, increase in the pulmonary vascularity, narrow pedicle, all uh, uh, make us suspect that this could be an x ray of a patient with transpersonal great arteries. And this is an x ray of a patient with transpersonal great arteries. Whenever you see, find that there are a pulmonary uh, increase in the pulmonary vascularity in a patient who is sinus, you must always start thinking whether it could be a trungus arteriosus or not. So you can see this kind of this classical picture is described as egg on side appearance. Okay, this is the last X-ray. X-ray. Calcification aneurysm. Yes, it is a post myocardial infarction calcification uh, 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 of the myocardium. And uh, he had only a small aneurysm, but uh, he had a, a significant calcification. It's a post MI calcification. It's a, uh, uh, and uh, mostly aneurysm is calcified. So he had a, some degree of aneurysm also. This is a post MI uh, uh, aneurysm with calcification. Very good, excellent. Okay, what is the diagnosis and what is the shunt? So, uh, in optimetry, so there is a uh, step up at RV level. Uh, 
Okay, there's a step of it, R11. Uh, is there a step of it, RV11? Uh, uh, sir, uh, RV, sir, seven. No, sir. No, it's only four. It's not okay. enough. Yes, sir. And also, the, sometimes due to streaming or the blood flow in a patient with a ASD, sometimes you may get step up in RF definitely, but on top of that, sometimes you may get a step up in RV also, which may not be enough to qualify it for a shunt at the level of the RV. So, this is a uh, the step up of 4 percentage seen at RV cannot be taken as evidence of a shunt coming to RV. Okay, right, yes. So, step up at uh, RA level. Uh, okay. In the pressure data, uh, no, no, so uh, diagnosis. What is the you tell me the pressure data and the uh, oximetry data and tell the diagnosis? So, what did you say, PS? Sir, because sir, uh, 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 no, sir. Uh, Sir, ASD, sir. ASD is there because there is an excellent step up at the RA level. Yes, so so there is a gradient across the pulmonary valve that is there, 15 millimeters of mercury gradient. So how will you explain that? That flow. Yes, there is a torrential flow and the gradient up to 15 or 20. Sometimes sir. even people have described even up to 40. So, so uh, 15 millimeters of mercury gradient across the pulmonary flow, pulmonary valve in a torrential ASD can be explained by the flow itself. So it is an increase in the flow. What is the QS to Q, QP to QS ratio? Yes. QP to QS, sir, we have to uh, find out uh, by uh, sir, QP, we have QP by QS, sir, uh, uh, amount of oxygen. Divided by no, no, you don't have to uh, for QP to QS ratio, you don't have to uh, go yes, to all those complications. We can do, sir. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. So, with saturation, sir, the step up answer. How will you make out sir, the QP to QS ratio? Sir, 90 minus uh, sir, uh, sir, pulmonary artery uh, minus. Uh, the pulmonary uh, 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 vein minus sir pulmonary artery sir we are okay what what uh, tell me you make up your mind the 99 minus 90 sir okay okay you get okay you get nine yes then then Sir, 98 minus hmm. uh, uh, this uh, so uh, three, sir. Uh, mix venous. Sir, mix venous here will be sir uh, uh, IVC plus 3 SVC. Hmm. So, so 71 plus uh, uh, no, no, you don't have to find out all those things. You find out the difference between IVC and SVC. So you can take there. There are two levels IVC so you could make it a 67 and what is the difference for four. so the uh, four divided and four divided by by four one, one. and you yeah, add that to the svc value okay. so here the svc can be taken as main is 67 68. and four divided by four is one so it can be taken as 68 so mixed between assemblies 60 68 uh, so, uh, okay right. 98 minus 68 oh. So 3.3. 90, so 99 minus 68. Okay. So what is this, uh, pulmonary flow? What is systemic flow? What is the ratio? 3.3, uh, sir. 3.3. 9 3. by 32. Yeah. So 30 is to Q, Q, P, Q, P to QS ratio is 30 to 9. So as uh, somebody has answered, it is 3.3. 3. Very good. So it's a high flow situation in a patient with ASD. Okay. Good. Okay, any doubts about uh, things that we have discussed so far? Any doubts? Okay, right, so next class we should have a case discussion. Is anybody willing to bring a case?
Ronak, can you bring a case? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, I am preparing for the exam, sir. It's difficult, but. Oh, okay. You are uh, uh, so it's more important for you to discuss. Uh, if you have, have you given your uh, theory examination or? No, I have uh, given theory examination. I am appearing for practical first phase. So, so that's extremely important for you to discuss it now. Yes, sir. You yes. Know? So if you can bring a case, that will be a good opportunity for you to discuss the case and perform very well in the examination. Okay, sir. I'll I'll try. I'll bring bring the case, sir. You you bring a case so that you can discuss and that will give you good orientation to how to discuss the case with the examiner and uh, the passing through the examination will be extremely yes, easy for sir. you. Actually, you can discuss two or three cases even because the the date for the practical examination has not yet been fixed. So there may be a gap of about one to two months before the practical examination date is fixed. So. You have got uh, enough opportunity to discuss. You know, the date is yeah. Or date is fixed. When is the date? First, first February. When? First February. February. First February. Okay. So you have got, you, can, you can discuss one one case. One case can be discussed. Yes, sir. And uh, I think these uh, spotters will be of great help to you because these are the spot uh, the ECG, X-ray, hemodynamics, and uh, uh, the the pressure the uh, the the uh, pressure tracing all these are the ones which will be brought as uh, uh, spotters and that will be a great help to you in the examination. Okay, so Ronak will bring a case for the next uh, Friday uh, next Friday discussion, and uh, you want uh, something to be discussed uh, next Friday, uh, Saroj? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You want it, sir? Index, sir. Okay. We'll we'll try to discuss that also, so that uh, uh, we are, we'll first discuss the case and then we'll discuss uh, uh, this uh, augmentation index. Okay, right. Any other point anybody wants to say? Okay, thank you. I think we'll stop at that level. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, sir. And the meeting with your permission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can. Thank you. Sir. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. 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 Thank you,